Hello, everyone. This is Neville Smith, Director of Education for EV University. Thank you very much for joining us for this very special session. This is a Q&A interview session with Ian Chisholm, otherwise known as Captain John Rourke of Clear Skies fame, the creator of the Clear Skies Machinima series, which is extremely popular amongst EVE players. Uh, welcome, John. We're very, very pleased. To, well, here I am calling you John. Excuse me. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> We're very pleased to have you here. You are, you're not the first person to do that. Um, one guy conducted an entire interview calling me John. Um, it's great to be here. It's an honor. Um, EV University is quite massive, and it's been a long-standing feature of the game. Um, so it's really nice to be invited on. I must admit, when I hear your voice like this, I do want to call you Captain Rourke. Uh, do you find that you are too affiliated now with the character, or is that something that bothers you, or is that a good thing? I, I think it's a good thing. I mean, we all want to be space captains. That's why we play the game. So um, getting that little bit closer than, than most everybody else is great. <laughs> so, yeah, call me Captain John Rourke. I don't mind. I think I'll call you Ian. Um, do want to say for those who are listening in who aren't familiar with Clear Skies, let me post the uh, the link to that. It's www.clearskiesthemovie.com, and you can download the uh, three episodes there. And we do encourage you to do that if you've uh, not seen any of the Clear Skies episodes. They are fantastic, especially if you're an Eve player. Uh, but even if you're not an Eve player, and, and Ian, I wanted to ask you about this. I've even shown Clear Skies to people who've never played the game, and they've really enjoyed it. Ed, have you been surprised by the popularity of the Clear Skies series, both with Eve players and those that aren't? I was surprised by the popularity of it full stop. I do remember that. I mean, I just did it as a creative exercise, the first one, for a bit of fun with me and my friends as well. And I figured I'd get like about 15 replies in the uh, forum thread and maybe a couple of thousand downloads in the you know after a year or so. Um, so yeah, the success of it really did surprise me. I must have touched something that a lot of people wanted. Um, but people enjoying it outside of eve was that was actually a, a decision to start with that i thought well i i don't want you to have to play eve to understand what's going on um and and to enjoy the plot and to get to know the characters so i kind of wrote it for just people who like science fiction um and it's very nice to hear that people outside of the eve universe really enjoy it uh, it shows that I, I kind of did what I'd set out to do in, the, in, to, in that I was making a uh, science fiction show for generally anyone out there who's interested in it. Let me ask you to go back. Um, tell us a little bit about your background in EVE. How did you discover EVE and when did you start playing? I had a friend, um, well, I still have a friend, a friend called James, who um, we used to email each other at work quite regularly way back in the early 2000s, and he sent me a link to a beta test of a really, really pretty looking spaceship game, um, and so I signed up for that beta test as well, as and a bunch of other people I know did, and uh, yeah, we started playing it from the pre-release days, and we joined up on day one even though my, my bio doesn't actually say I go back that far. It's out by a few months, but anyway. Um, uh, yeah, and, and we just started playing it from, from day one, really. Um, that's that's kind of my Eve background. I used to play it a lot back then until I got involved with these st stupid movie things. <laughs> took up all my time. <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that you did it as kind of a creative venture, but what, what really inspired you to do uh, Clear Skies? Uh, the first episode, and also, did you envision that it would be a series or a trilogy? I, oh, let's see. I've always been a kind of creative person, um, so I can't just sit and passively watch TV all the time and all that sort of stuff. So my, my mind runs away with things that I want to do. And um, I made a couple of the Eve videos to music things that you see, but I got frustrated by the inability to actually kind of tell a story while it's uh, all the stuff's happening on screen. And so I kind of forgot about that until one day whilst monkeying around in a video editor, I discovered the compositing stuff, the blue screen, and I thought, I could do something with this. And I, I did a quick technology test, and I, I, I messed about in Hammer, which is the editor for Half-Life 2 maps, 
um, I'd used that before, so I quickly knocked up a basic bridge of a Tempest battleship, and then um, chroma keyed on a warping through the system of Oimo, it was. Um, and the tears on my arms stood up when I realised I've got characters, I can face pose them and lip sync, we can act, we can have cameras, we can we can have exterior shots and interior and blend the two. And it was just uh, an incredible moment. Um, and then I had to sit down and think, well, actually, if I'm going to do this, I'll do this properly. Um, and I'm not going to record a damn thing until I've got a script and a, and a plot sorted out and the sets built and all that kind of jazz. And I thought, well, the best thing to do would be to make a kind of a, a pilot show. Um, so you introduce the characters, the universe and have a bit of action and sort of just open it up to whatever else would happen. I never realized how much time it would take. It took over two years to get from that first thought to releasing clear skies one. Um, but yeah, it, I had a vague idea of a story arc about six episodes, but, you know, I kind of dumped that as soon as I realised just how much work it took. And um, I just included some of the ideas for those in the Clear Skies 2. Now, when you posted Clear Skies 1, uh, what, was your, what was your benchmark of success? How many downloads and views were you looking for? And were you surprised by the popularity? I, I was looking for um, 2,500 downloads, and there's a specific reason for that. It's that I estimated I'd spent 1,500 hours um, creating CS1. It was only a rough guess, but that's kind of what I settled on. And it was 40 minutes long. So if you multiply 40 minutes by um, 2,500, you come to 1,500 hours. And I thought, that's officially a break-even point. As many people have spent they've spent the same amount of time watching it as I spent making it and I'll be happy. So that was what I was aiming at when we cracked two and a half thousand in 48 hours. Um, yeah, I was kind of surprised. So, uh, so were most of my friends as well. There was a lot of frantic texting like Japanese schoolgirls going, Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> so we handled it quite well. A number of uh, people in the Eve university, uh, including Seamus Donahue who's actually listed in, uh, Clear Skies 3 on the uh, and one of the scenes that you have there um, mentions that it uh, wasn't for Clear Skies, you never would have joined Eve, and I've seen that a lot. Have you heard that a, a lot as well? I have. Um, I've, I've heard it from quite a few people. Either they joined up because they watched the films first, or they re- reactivated their accounts because it inspired them again, which is fantastic. Um, I love that, and uh, if if I can inspire those sorts of stirring emotions in people to go and do that, then I've done what I wanted to do as a storyteller and as a, as a director. So, yeah, I'm really pleased with that. I have a question. Why hasn't CCP hired you? They can't afford me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that's good. No, the, well, I know a lot of people have even gone to the length of starting threads on the forum saying you must employ this person but it's very sweet of them but um i do actually have my own life um and i've got a really good job at the moment um doing deep dive problem management in um a sort of couple of thousand server e-commerce estate for aviva so you know i love that it sparks my creative um skills and uh, and it pays a lot because i do ghastly shift work with 12 hour night shifts we do have a number of questions coming, and I, I do want to get to some of those. I do have one other question. You and I were talking uh, a little bit before the interview here, and you mentioned now that you are a an Eve personality. Uh, do you find uh, that people are uh, are out to get you? Well, um, I, I haven't played it much since releasing CS3 uh, yet, so I don't know exactly how that stands. I have had quite a few people out and set me to... Um, excellent standing even though they're in um, adversarial uh, alliances which is very nice but there's two incidents that spring to mind about the the fame as it were uh one was me and back then a lot of the uh, austin crew were still playing this was after clear skies 2 uh, me and haffer and solomon and charlie and twiglet but he wasn't in them um we we're flying across one of those big ass systems that's like 160 AUs. And there's one other guy in local. And he realized that he got pretty much the main cast of Clear Skies in local with him. And he just 
absolutely spazzed out. <laughs> He's t- typing in broken English uh, things like, um, it is you, I see you in the film, you are of the film. So we all started quoting our lines to him. So, yeah, that was that was nice. Um, actually, I've remembered a couple of other things while I'm talking, a couple of quick ones. I went out hunting in the, in um, North North regions with, with me mate Twiglet. And so we, we rock up in some um, dodgy 0.0 place and there's a couple of people and it looks like they might be mining. Excellent. We thought we were going to be really nasty. We'll cloak up, sneak in and um, and, and go and blow them up. And we were, <laughs> we were halfway across in warp and the guy in local goes, hey, John Rourke, hey, uh, you're clear skies great film love it thanks and uh, poor old twiglet says you are the worst person in eve to go on a covert mission with <laughs> yeah you would uh, kind of stand out in local for sure yeah pretty much um i i remember we were in uh, a fight this is one of the negatives of the fame um there was about 20 of us stooging around we'd, we'd gone through a wormhole and we were we were caught in this pipe system uh where there was you know an exit at one end an exit at another end and we'd been rumbled that we were causing trouble and there was a fleet of 50 waiting at one end and a fleet of 50 waiting at the other so we went oh well we'll, we'll leroy jenkins it piled into the, the one system they're all waiting at the gate we walked to the gate brilliant no bubble was up everyone can jump through but of course the bubble was waiting on the other side so, I thought, well, we'll let everybody else panic first. And I held my cloak, you know, a good teamwork, this, of course, on my behalf. And, um, and like about 15 of the people I was with decloaked, and they all started getting locked up. And there was missiles, there was shots fun, there was laser beams everywhere. And I thought, right, no one's looking. Excellent. And I quietly decloaked and tried to scuttle off in another direction. And I found out afterwards that half of my teammates got away because suddenly they were unlocked and they were, no one was shooting at them. And I had like 15 or 17 people on my bloody kill mail. As soon as they saw my name crop up, <laughs> that was it. So you were obviously, well, they, they, you could be a wonderful fleet mate to have in your, uh, in your gang then, for sure. <laughs> as long as it's not covert ops. <laughs> I have a few questions from the audience. And by the way, folks, uh, if you have a question for Ian, feel free to type it in the lecture.e-uni chat channel, and we'll take as many of those as we possibly can. Um, I had a comment earlier that was kind of interesting. Uh, the uh, John Rourke was the uh, main character in The Fountainhead. Is that the reason why you selected the name for your character? No, um, actually... John Rourke's the lead character in a series called The Survivalist, written by Jerry Ahern, but although he's quite a fan of Anne Rand, um, and I, I collected and read all of those books over a period of about 12 years, um, so I, I used his name because he's like my childhood hero. That's it, really. I've only ever met one other person in Eve who's read the books, so no one's rumbled the fact that I stole the name instead of made it up. I stand corrected. It's Howard Rourke. Thank you. Uh, I did have that wrong. But uh, you were inspired by uh, a, 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 someone who was a fan of Ayn Rand. Though. Yes, yes, in a way, yes. Uh, I'm per- personally not a fan of Ayn Rand. But <laughs> that's nothing to do with anything, really. One of our uh, our, our teaching manager, Alelsa, asks uh, has to ask you, uh, is that an East Anglican accent? Um, East Anglian. Anglican means something horribly different. Ah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mishmash of accents. I've lived in East Anglia for um, uh, most of my life, but I've been away to, uh, I went to university in Leicester and I've been accused of having all sorts of, you know, for anything from London to Birmingham accents. So it's kind of mostly East Anglia now, though, yeah. It sounds like a mishmash, as someone else has said here. Uh, Lily Tain asks, why a tempest in the movies? Uh, it's, uh, it looks like a pile of scrap, or is it just your favorite ship? It was the first battleship I ever had. Um, so, obviously, when I was filming Clear Skies 1, I didn't have, didn't have the test server to do anything on. Um, and so I had to use what I had, really. And plus, also, it was the only battleship configuration where you could zoom in on the bridge close enough to get that transition shot. So uh, it was a natural for it. And as it turns out, it's the most characterful 
ship you know of that size that you can get i think um the the ship is the fourth member of the crew really it wouldn't be any fun if it was big awesome and just worked you know i wanted to ask you about that and one thing about the clear skies movies uh, much different than many other of the fan films that are out there uh it's very character and plot driven was that by design or did that just happen by accident because of the chemistry between you and john and dan and other members of the uh, of the cast well i i wrote the script obviously to be um character and plot dependent uh, there's there's a million and one um films out there of, of eve online footage with lots of explosions and shooting and and a large amount of post-production and they're, they're very good they're technically excellent and they're quite exciting to watch but it's kind of a bit like eating popcorn or bubble gum there's no actual substance to them um now while my production skills aren't as good as some of those guys part of that's because i can't spend six months doing five minutes worth of footage um you know i've got 75 minutes to do uh, and it's a lot more complex to generate so uh the, while the visuals aren't as good as some of those the storyline and the plot to me is everything because you can't as they say polish a poo it doesn't matter how good the visuals are if your script doesn't mean anything and um one of the decisions i made early on was none of us are voice actors we've never done anything like this before we're pretty much going to have to act like our own selves so what the way that you see uh sol and charlie and me behave on screen is that's especially in the first one that's pretty much how we interact anyway we're always ripping into each other and always saying stupid things at inappropriate moments we well, do have a lot of chemistry and obviously you've uh crystallize that in the in the script writing script writing is excellent and it's a great story uh, and also as it turns out it it spans across these three different episodes and kind of this uh, comprehensive arc did you envision that it would have that kind of interconnectedness amongst the three movies or was that something that just evolved as you were creating them? um the second one was a uh, easier to do because it comprised a lot of the plot elements i've been thinking about anyway when i mentioned um that, that it was kind of a six episode a vague six episode arc um whereas the third one you know i wasn't doing a third one and i know i should have the tm after uh, after that because i sat after each of them um but yeah the, there was a lot of stuff i could go back and touch um there was a careful balance between nods to the previous two and just rehashing the same jokes over and over again and that kind of thing. So it was quite, quite carefully done to avoid, you know, there was no how much or how long this time. Um, but we did have another reference to the top wingy bit because people like it. And it would be plausible that the guys still call it that. You know, th- there's a lot of... Th- and and the, the being able to go back and say, oh, that's what Mr. Smith was doing in the system of heck in the first one, that was just blind luck. That was great. It just fell out of the script writing. So, you know, a lot of it is uh, fortuitous rather than I planned it three or four years ago. We have a couple of other questions here. I want to get back uh, to some of the questions that are being asked in lecture.e-uni. Uh, Halberdine asks, uh, none of the vessels in Clear Skies use drone capability. And, and to add on that, I noticed that the whole capsule ear living in your pod aspect of EVE is not included as well. Was that part of a decision to make Clear Skies accessible to non-EVE players, or were you limited by other things like the animation that you were using? That is a good question. There's, there's several answers to it, um, two of which you just touched on. Uh, one is that there's a technical reason for not using drones. They are tiny, and um, even when I had access to the Jessica engine, they were still just too small to be of any use. Um, so it, they were impossible to film um, if you're just filming live in the EVE game itself. Excuse me. Um, and uh, another reason is that I never needed an needed drones you know i didn't want to just wedge in a game mechanic just because they existed in the game the the series are based on the eve universe but they're not like a documentary and of exactly how it all works quite obviously i took the rules and i bent them in the in the for the name of good storytelling and um you know the whole pod pilot thing was very easy on two counts one is 
how on earth could you film character interaction if there's just one idiot floating in a load of goop? It's just not going to happen. And the other is cloning. It was a very early decision I made. It was that in my universe, there's no cloning because otherwise you remove fear of death. And without that, there's no real tension. Um, and, and I think it would destroy any kind of, um, any kind of film if there's no fear of death. Lazarus Wild asks, uh, how much support has CCP given you? We touched on this uh, a little earlier, but have they given you any official support and uh, and helping you to make the movie? They gave me the Jessica engine, which is a phenomenal amount of support and a large amount of trust to put in um, an individual that does, has nothing to do with CCP. There's a lot of proprietary tech in that, so I had to sign a couple of NDAs and so on and so forth, but um, they did it on the back, back of Clear Skies 1 and 2. Uh, they loved it. Um, they invited me over to Iceland. I got shown around the offices, met everyone. They were all very nice. And they gave me a quick crash course on the most horrific user interface known to man, which is the Jessica engine. And uh, and then, like, packed me up and, and got rid of me because <laughs> uh, one of their primary things was they want it to remain a community project. They said, as soon as you put a CCP logo on there, you'll get idiots on the Internet saying, yeah, but it's all done by them. You know, and and that is completely true. Uh, so they gave me a couple of pointers about the Jovian stuff, gave me the Jessica engine, and said, "Make something awesome." Uh, you do list a lot of people in the credits who've assisted you, and obviously appear with you in in the movies. But I get the impression that most of the work is actually done by you. How much of the actual creative effort for the Clear Skies movies was actually done by you? I have to say it's probably ninety five percent of it. It's a, it's a ridiculous amount of effort. It's one of the reasons why there won't be a fourth one. The thing's gotten just too big for one person to do, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you may, because <laughs> I want to do something else now. But, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of things I was helped out with. Um, I'm not much good at artwork and stuff, so a friend of mine helped me with the reskinning and some of the textures that you see on screens. Um Another chap's good at modelling, so he helped with some tweaking of the motion capture. Another person's excellent at the set design. Um, I mean, my set design guy was absolutely awesome. If you saw the the Titan bridges and the the, the hangar bay, it was on screen for 10 seconds. What a waste, you know, but that's the way it fell out. Um, and uh, DJ Sam off Eve Radio, I knew for, at university, she got in touch with me after 13 years of us losing contact because she recognised me in Clear Skies 1, um, which was really cool. And she did the lip syncing for Clear Skies 3, which took an enormous load off of, uh, off of me. But then I added an enormous load back on by having to learn and use the Jessica engine and all the mocap gear. So, yeah, I've spent thousands of hours on it. Um, most of it is me, despite the long list of credits. <laughs> I'd like to revisit that later and also some of the technical aspects of how you put that together, but we do have some other questions, and I want to get those in as well. Uh, Ileana Durana asks, is there any place to find the, quote, official, unquote, clear skies ship fitting? <laughs> oh, the ship fitting. Oh, dear. Oh, yes. Well, a bit of a blunder on my behalf, uh, folks, because um, I just needed a screen. So I nailed uh, any old rubbish together and uh, screen captured it, put it in on on the set and forgot about it. I didn't realise people would be zooming in on it and taking apart what all the fittings were. Um, I tried to make a better job of it in CS3. I actually fitted my personal fleet Tempest out with the same guns and the probe launcher and the YF-12 and then the shield stuff. And, and they always use shields even though armor tank this, armor tank that, yeah, I know, but everyone understands shields when it comes to sci-fi. You know, if you've watched Star Trek, you know what shields are. If you've watched Star Wars, you know what shields are. So ships have shields, that's that. If I start introducing um, uh, armor tanking, I'm going to lose a lot of people who don't play EVE. But, of course, the ship was rigged with three armor tank-based rigs, and people have picked up on that going like, oh, my God, foul fit. Yes, well, I wasn't going to rip out 50 million quids worth of um, fittings just for one screen capture. Um, yeah, so uh, the official fitting is as big a guns as possible and some other crap. <laughs> Do you find that there's a lot of players who 
or picking at the various things you've got in the background or looking at different ships and saying, oh, that's you've got that wrong, Ian. You, you did that wrong. And, and do, they, do they tell you about these things? There's, there's some of that. Um, a lot of people scour it for uh, the little Easter eggs that I drop in there. But some people have said things like, well, ob- obviously, I know it's ridiculous. I know the Tempest has varying amounts of speed you know depending on the situation it's slow reaching a gate in a gate fight it's fast getting away from drones it's just blown up a little bit too fast if i I do agree with that but um uh, they, they say um that's not a fighter that's an interceptor yeah i don't care and people who who watch it shouldn't really be caring about that um it's it's a small ship the concept has gotten across to the viewer that it's it's an interceptor it, it intercepts things it looks small it's going fast it's got some guns brilliant so that's all really that, that you need to know uh, plus i really couldn't be asked to get all of that right for the amount of uh, it wouldn't have added anything to the film as far as i'm concerned so i couldn't really see a point in busting a gut trying to get the the um accuracy down to that kind of a level i'm, I'm sorry if that offend some people but um i did have an awful lot of other stuff to do well, i think it made for a better story no doubt and also uh made it more accessible uh shutter and Arif asks uh have you ever done anything with gary's mod uh, which is a popular mod for the half-life 2 engine i think i've seen a comment of that on your website but you i know. think you have <laughs> no i've never i've never installed it i've never owned it i've never used it it's the one thing that really bugs the hell out of me is when people waltz onto a forum or post on a YouTube comment saying, ah, oh, nice use of Gary's mod in that smug, self-satisfied way that they know what I've done and all that sort of stuff. And it just really annoys me. I, I liken it as like it's a, it's one of those little 200 quid um, digital cameras compared to a Nikon digital SLR that cost you like seven grand. That's what the uh, source SDK is. Um, so no, no Gary's mod. Don't mention it in my presence again. Thank you. <laughs> Have you done any non uh, or used any non Eve related mods in, uh, in in your work? Um, well, obviously the entirety of Half Life Two, if that's what you mean. Um, and uh, a mod for that called Neo Tokyo. It's got an awful lot of um, new models and textures in that I could use for the for dressing the sets and all that sort of stuff. And it really added a lot of new visual elements to Clear Skies 3. And it was really nice of those guys to say, yeah, knock yourself out, just have whatever you want. Because we did ask for permission first. Um, and that's why they got a credit in, in the, the end credits. Um, you mentioned earlier that you have done some other videos. Uh, I think you mentioned you did another E video, or have you done any other uh, other E related videos? Um, I did a couple of uh, yeah, the, the really old stuff. It's, it's so old; it's in the original graphics engine. It was just um, some Eve clips set to music, um, and that's kind of what opened up my enjoyment of doing video editing really and I've, I've done a couple of other things of like videos of me and my mates messing about in cars and stuff like that but otherwise no nothing special although on my youtube channel there is a short um comedy skit that i made in uh supreme commander of all things <laughs> so you should be able to find that if you look on my youtube channel uh, poetic Stanziel asks, uh, at what point of the development of Clear Skies did the idea of uh, the red sofa or the couch come to you? Um, I was browsing through all of the models that came with Half-Life 2. Because, you know, one of the one of the big drags at the right at the start was, okay, what have I got to do uh, to, to make this with um so i trawled through every single model in half-life 2 whilst making notes of like oh this could be good this could be good for that this could be good for the other and now i did the same thing with the textures and i did the same thing with the sound effects and i found this couch this nice red couch and i thought actually if you've got a privateer who spends most of his time on a ship it's not just going to be some anodyne sterile environment like a military ship would be you know like a company car check it out check it back in again go home to your station um so i thought well he's going to have his own place and why wouldn't that place be on the bridge of his own ship to sit there and look out the windows 
So I picked the red sofa. I could have picked, I think there was a yellow or a green one, but luckily I picked the red one. It is kind of another character. It's certainly at the end of uh, CS2. It uh, plays a major role. Yeah, it does. Um, I, I truly can't remember where the hell I got that idea from. Um, I think we were originally, because uh, I was bouncing ideas off of Richie Powell's, and I think originally we were going to have a chunk of Clear Sky smash into his ship and take him out. And um, it was either me or Richie, and we had one of those overexcitable moments where you just can't get the idea out fast enough, where we're saying, like, oh, it'll be a, a big bit of the ship that, that comes off and hits him. And, uh, oh, oh, no, 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 actually, oh, I could, I did, uh, listen, 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 listen. The sofa, the sofa. I mean, oh my god, that's brilliant! So yeah, we went for that. Well, it's 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 one of the recurring themes in uh, in Clear Skies. It's uh it's a, for those who haven't seen it, it's definitely a motif that everyone grabs onto. In fact, I've seen a uh, a suggestion on your Facebook page for Clear Skies that uh, perhaps you, if you ever do revisit uh, Clear Skies, perhaps uh, some prequels. Uh, call it the Saga of the Red Sofa. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, bless them. There's a lot of suggestions on the Facebook page. Um, the one one thing they're onto a loser is is that I hate prequels because again, no fear of death. We know they're going to survive because they've got all the films uh, that come after that time period. Um, so yeah, there, there won't be any of those. But I, I do like all these crazy ideas that people keep coming up with. Can I just say that I'm not really keeping up with the text chat, by the way, so I'm not ignoring anyone on there if they've asked me anything directly. Yeah, I'm I'm going through it, so no worries there. And uh, at any point you want to take a break, just uh, give the word and we'll do that as well. Okay. Um, You did not do this as a commercial venture, but have the movies paid for themselves? If maybe not commercially, perhaps in in other ways, giving you more exposure? Uh, has, it, has it been in any way lucrative for you? Um, it's not been lucrative in real life. I've spent probably about £4,000 of my own money on um, hardware and software and stuff to get done. Um, but I don't begrudge that in the slightest because I would have done that anyway. You know, I wasn't expecting anything back. I was spending money on something I enjoyed doing, and that's what money's for, really. Um, in-game, brilliant. I've got 11 billion ISK, and uh, and I've given away some of that to my friends and, and spent it on big, shiny uh, strategic cruisers and stuff like that. So it's nice to be probably the only person in EVE Online that makes their living um, through film royalties, so that's good. Um Lucrative in a uh, getting into the film industry in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it has. I've got a, a, this. These three films. There's a heck of a portfolio behind me now. I did this in my own time, and I did, and I now understand what it takes to get from design stage to actually releasing it, and all the stuff in between. Um, so that's good for uh, perhaps trying to jump ship out of the. IT industry and get into that, which I, I really want to do. I've got the opportunities here. Um, and also, I got to meet uh, Ricky Grove and Francis Capra, who were in Clear Skies 3, who were both, of course, actual real Hollywood actors. So that was a real bonus. Yeah, Nathan Whedon follows up on that and asks, uh, I might be able to connect you with some people in Hollywood to make a real series of this. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Uh, Nathan? He sounds like a very nice man. I like him already. <laughs> it, as you just said, that is something you're interested in, perhaps having the series picked up or worked on by others or worked on by uh, by you. I spent, uh, I've spent probably, every, I've done some stuff on this every day for the last six years. That's 10, 20% of my life I've been doing Clear Sky stuff for nothing and grinding away, even when it's horrific. So can you imagine what I'd be like if I had full support and got paid for it? God damn, yes, I want to do it. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, Neris uh, Telvanens asks, in the series you don't mention any Eve corpse like Goon Swarm or Eve University, for that matter. Uh, was that done on purpose, or did you just not think to name drop uh, in that way? You know, no, I didn't name drop anyone because 
um, things shift, it'd be as embarrassing as, as uh, the Americans supporting the Afghanistan in Rambo, and now suddenly they're the enemy, you know what I mean? Um, the only nods I did were really to individuals that helped me out, and you can see that from the there's the the sacrifice board in Clear Skies 3, which is everyone who donated money after CS2. And then the, there's the people on the station in CS2, which was everyone who donated after CS1. Um, I mentioned Otherworld Mining, specifically because that's Cribber's corporation. It fitted into the plot quite nicely because I needed a mining corporation name, so why the hell not, seeing as I've murdered his bandwidth on three separate occasions. No, you know, that kind of thing. But I've had a couple of people say, we'll give you in-game ISK if you advertise our stuff, or I'll pay you if you have a poster of me on the wall behind the crew. And I was like, I'm, I'm really not that desperate for risk, guys. I'm, there's no adverts um, and, and none of that to, to ruin it for uh, the people who are trying to watch it, really. I wanted to ask you about the music, and uh, Takai Matsuomo, Matsumoto also asks, uh, you use a lot, a lot of Mike Oldfield tunes. I'd uh, like to know if you're a fan of Mike Oldfield. And also, how did you select the music? Did you have that in mind as you were writing the scenes, or is that something you do put together later? Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of Mike Oldfield. Uh, I really like his stuff. And because he doesn't, fit to traditional genres of like your three four minute rock track you know with lyrics and verse chorus verse chorus and all that kind of thing um he writes stuff that has mood and has feeling uh and you can use that in in film sequences way way better than you could if you're just trying to put a yet another angry american rock track over something you know so his his it's not because i'm fixated on him in fact i tried not to use him quite so much but if the music fits, you know, I'd be stupid not to use it. Um, as for matching the music up to the scenes, sometimes the scene was actually written around the piece of music. Uh, I used to listen to um, Far Above the Clouds, the Mike Oldfield track that I used for the gate fight in Clear Skies 2. I used to listen to that on the bus and think, I need to do an action sequence to this, and it's got to be some sort of fleet fight where they're... Uh, where they're building to a climax frantically whilst under fire and, and damned if it didn't work. I've noticed there are a number of people on YouTube who have specifically cut that scene out uh, and have only that scene uh, emphasizing the, the music and the action. So obviously that uh, struck a chord. It did. Um, and also if, if you uh, just look on YouTube for that track, for Far Above the Clouds, you'll find that the comments have been invaded by EVE players and Clear Skies viewers. And in fact, there was one chap called Juan Carlos, who was a Mike Oldfield fan, and he looked for that on um, YouTube and found all this get this interdictor nonsense and wondered what the hell people were talking about. Uh, so he looked that up found the films, watched them, was becoming a massive fan, and he actually he flew over from Spain to watch it at the cinema with us in Norwich and then flew back, which is just incredible. And he has no idea what Eve Online is. He was just looking for Mike Oldfield track. Shutterren uh, also asks, uh, do you know the TV series Firefly? Did that impact the series at all? Were there any other sci-fi uh, films or TV shows that influenced Clear Sky? I, I was introduced to Firefly via the film Serenity. Um, and uh, I went, ended up re-watching uh, the Firefly series, although it was, it was during a particularly nasty part of my life where, where a lot of bad things happened in the family. So it was good to watch those 13 episodes or however many they got uh, to take our mind off of what the hell was going on. So I have a special place for old Serenity in my heart. And also the film to me is, um, it's just screams. This is how you do a science fiction film. This is how you do the spaceship stuff. They introduce the characters, the universe and kick the plot off in such a tight and interesting fashion at the start. I'm wildly envious of their abilities. So I love that film. I've watched it five or six times, and I can cheerfully watch it again and again. Um, I guess I, I was kind of influenced by it. I, I didn't specifically take parts. I didn't specifically lift stuff from it. And besides, I think Clear Skies won. I don't know if it came out first or not, but I definitely did CS1 before I'd even heard of it. So... 
you know, I'm, I was a big, I'm a big fan of it, but it didn't influence me that much. Um, I don't know, really. People have mentioned Red Dwarf comedy series as well, and I, I was wa- re-watching the A-Team as well, so that kind of taught me how to do the plot elements and the pacing and the camera angles and that kind of thing. So there you go. <laughs> well, it sounds like you had a number of different inspirations. Uh, we do have a question here uh, as well from Hald uh, Berdeen about uh, the voice cast originally were your friends, but you did have professionals, as you mentioned, uh, did you have any other professionals that were involved in other capacities in Clear Skies? And also, how did you connect with those professional actors and get them to uh, participate in the project? Well, um, I, I haven't had any other professional help um, from any anything like filmmaking or lighting, although I, I sort of did. Uh, the chap who plays Haffer, Mark Germany, he, while all this has been going on, he's actually become an accredited um, photographer. So he taught me all about lighting. That's why he's my director of photography. So that's kind of professional help because he's an official professional photographer now. And, of course, the lighting was so much better in CS3 than the green murky soupiness of CS1 and 2. Um, now, as for the Ricky Grove and the Francis Capra story, Ricky has always been a fan of machinima and voice acting and this kind of thing. And I entered CS1 into an expo that he was running online, and he loved it so much he dropped me a line saying, after watching 120 submissions, you know, this was a breath of fresh air and it blew me away. And I thought, I like this man. So <clears throat> we got chatting and. Um, it wasn't until like a couple of months later I actually found out he was a pucker Hollywood actor and he he played um, Henry the Red in Army of Darkness, Evil Dead 3, which is like one of my favourite films. I had a complete fan gush moment at him and, and you know, he's he's been helping me out with sound design and things like that since. And I thought his voice is excellent and I... I, I thought his voice would be perfect for that part in Clear Skies 3. So I asked him, and he jumped at the chance. He, he'd been wanting to work with me since CS1, so that's quite flattering, and that was very nice. Um, as for Francis, that was an, an incredible bit of serendipity. Uh, he was in a show called Veronica Mars that ran for three seasons, and uh, some of my friends are re- real convention lovers. They go down to sci-fi conventions, Star Fury stuff. We go and see the cast of Battlestar Galactica and all that kind of thing. And I went to this one convention which had, um, which was about Veronica Mars, and Francis was there amongst other people, <coughs> and uh, he was sat at a little round table discussion where there was ten people and him just talking away and he was saying he was he wanted to break into voice acting because he wanted to try something different from normal on screen acting he's a world of warcraft player an avid one and he he tried to join up with a, a machinima group that did the voice acting and stuff but they wouldn't believe he was Fran- the real francis capra and they, they slagged him off so he, he left them in disgust and not surprising, really. So he was bemoaning this to my three friends. And, and they kind of like, one of them raised a hand and just said, I think we've got someone you might want to meet. And and everything just kicked off from there. And I can't thank my friends enough for that. Um, Twelve hours later, I was down there in London as well at this hotel, clutching the script for Clear Skies 3. And, um, yeah, I uh, running him through it all and, and getting his buy-in on the project, which is just unbelievable. It was such an opportunity, and he was so good at it. Uh, it was disgusting how good he was. <laughs> uh, and it, it was an honour to work with him. Loved it. So did you write that uh, the, the ghost character in CS3 with him in mind, or did you have that written uh, before you cast him in the role? I had it written before. Um, the, the script was pretty much finalised at this point, but I hadn't. That I literally just started voice recording, and unfortunately, the thing I just started voice recording was the character of Ghost. My friend Andy Carter, the chap who did all the texturing and, and that sort of stuff, he was originally down to play Ghost, and so I'd written him as a kind of a Cockney because Andy's got a London accent. He's a bit called cool, Blimey Governor, um, so I had to rewrite some of it to fit in more with, um, uh, you know, Francis's accent and, and the way he delivers lines. 
but the rewrite was not particularly difficult. Uh, I had to bum Bandy, obviously, out of the part, which I was most apologetic for, and he's never let me forget. But, you know, when an opportunity like this comes along, I'm sure my friends will understand. Well, he does a fantastic job. I mean, he is a very unsavory adversary in the movie and and, uh, someone you don't particularly like, which I think is your intent. Yeah, we... We decided, when I say we, I mean me and Richie, we decided we didn't want just some random nutter again because we had random mysterious nutter in CS1 and then complete lunatic in CS2. There's like this crazy racist guy who wants to kill everyone who isn't killing Galentes or something like that. And we thought, oh, we've got to have some actual plausible reasons this time around. So Ghost's character was written in the style of he's a mercenary. He's not necessarily evil. He just really doesn't care about anything that isn't him getting his money and moving on. And and, and that implies evilness at times. But um, he's not, you know, strictly evil. He's just professional and very good at what he does. We do have a few other questions here. Uh, Nerese Tavanen also asks, um, is Charlie, uh, John, the John Guthrie, uh, who, who John Guthrie plays, I understand that uh, John Guthrie has gotten back into Eve and is flying uh, Charlie Fodder around uh, once again, at least according to the posts on uh, the Facebook page. Uh, anyway, Nerese wants to know, is Charlie a fundamentally flawed individual? <laughs> yes, of course he is. Yeah. Um, I, I just couldn't resist that line. Uh, not only was it, it was the the horror of oh my god the f bomb in a clear skies because obviously I've written it so as my mum could watch it and 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 my neighbours can and kids can watch it and so forth. So the re- it's really quite un- non sweary. So to put that in, I thought I'm going to get away with this. And then of course the next line is ah ha ha ha. It wasn't the f bomb. So I was actually coming out with a particularly convoluted insult. So, yeah, he's fundamentally flawed, but then aren't we all? <laughs> it's on me, Avio asks, um, did you keep your skill cue going for all the years that you were filming and editing? Did you keep your character skill cue going in Eve? Yes, I did. Yep. Uh, I did. There's been a few times where I've gone like maybe 10 days or more without a skill going because I've just forgotten about it. But, yeah, I've just cracked, I think, about 120, 130 million points, something like that. Uh, Baltier Yudai asks, uh, primarily the main joy of Clear Skies is the interaction between the characters, as we discussed earlier. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, that this is a science fiction story. That was your main goal. Uh, do you feel that you've now evolved or moved beyond that goal, and, and would you return to it? Uh, I think you. the question he's trying to get at is, will there be a Clear Skies 4 or something else? There won't be a Clear Skies 4. There's several reasons for that. Um, one is life moves on. I've spent six years doing this. Um, in the last year, I've met up with a, a beautiful and wonderful girl, and you know, we're looking to get a house together and all that kind of shenanigans. And with my shift work and her doing a nine to five job, our time together is, you know, it's precious. It's fairly limited. So there's no way I can spend two years of my life again doing uh, this. Um, Clear Skies has also gotten too big for one person, if I'm not being paid for it, hint, hint. Um, So there's too much to do now, and I can't ask other people to have the same insanely committed dedication that I had for producing them. Uh, It's too much of an ask, and also I would find it very difficult to have to rely on someone else and, and entrust part of my project to someone else who I know isn't as crazily dedicated as I am, and that will just cause friction. And uh, the last reason is, of course, there's not really anything left for me to to push myself on. I mean, I only did CS3 because I I could choreograph the space sequences and I could act out all the motion capture. I could do a fist fight, I could do a uh, uh, a gunfight, and we could have the ship flipping over and flying through the station. I could do all the exciting things that have been stuck in my head, but the limitations of the game engines wouldn't let me do. And that was great. But I couldn't do, and I can't do another step up like that without going live action, and I'm certainly not going to be able to do that. So yeah, unfortunately, that is the end of Clear Skies. But I am looking at writing. I've already started work writing on a actual proper movie um, screenplay to see if I can get anywhere with that. It's worth a try. These these opportunities don't come along very often in life, so I'm grabbing them. 
That's fantastic. You realize, of course, that uh, no one will believe you and everyone will be hounding you for another Clear Skies prequel or sequel or spinoff or something for years to come. This is true. Yeah, they, they really aren't getting the hint either, which is nice, I suppose, because people liked it so much they're clamoring for more. If people were saying, well, thank God that's over, I think I'd be in a much worse situation. But um, always leave the audience wanting more, as they say, and uh, I will refer them to uh, Claire, my girlfriend, if anybody uh, gets too too demanding, because she'll buy their heads off. The Bink asks, uh, you mentioned that CCP gave you some information about the Jovians. Uh, does that mean that uh, the stuff in them uh, are about uh, the Jovians in CS3? Uh, is that fairly canon? No. No, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't take anything that I've said in any of the films as any kind of canon. Um, I had the Jovians... The, the, the limit of their import was that I had the Jovians as this lovely benevolent race. And uh, the Eve guy said, you are so wrong. And I thought, ah, well, I'm going to have to rewrite that a bit. And then I had a big struggle of like, well, how can I make them evil without having them just wander up and set fire to everything? Uh, And I I struck on the idea of like, well, what if they're constantly playing off the four aces to keep them always, you know, in conflict and and stopping them from everything turning into one super race, and then that would be a threat to the Jovians, because at the moment they could swat any of the four at once, but if maybe if one of them got powerful and rallied all the others together, or or subsumed them into one big race, the Jovians would have a nasty threat, so yeah, I thought that's quite a plausible reason for them to be uh, messing about our affairs. Renwick Sands asks a good question. Let me paraphrase it here. It has to do with copyright on the music that you used. Uh, is it all fair use, or have you had any issues with copyright? No, it's, it's not fair use, no. Um, it was a, a decision on my behalf was um, it's not for profit. I'm not making any money off of it. Hopefully no one will mind, and they'll leave me alone. And in fact, you know, it's been pretty good advertising for at least Mike Oldfield. I know that much, because people have gone out and bought the albums. I haven't had any grief um, from anyone. I hope that will continue. I know there's a bit of a risk, but I think it'd be quite... um, It'd be quite petty for anyone to come in and try and stomp all over all all of this positive um, promotional stuff almost for their music. Um, just because I didn't pay them $50,000 or something. So, no, it's, none of it's fair use. It's all nicked. You had uh, bucket reels for the first two movies, uh, and, or blooper reels, I guess we'd call them. Lazarus Wild would like to know, will there be a blooper reel for Clear Skies 3? Yes, there will. Yep, that's. Uh, I'm going to be filming the motion capture for that tomorrow night, so it's definitely in the offing. Uh, the good news is the reason why it's taking so long, apart from the fact that I just needed a break from it, um, is because I've got about 10 minutes worth of outtakes, for crying out loud, and those are only the ones I thought were good enough to go in. So it's going to be uh, a big one. Goral Abras asks, do you use a, uh, or did you use a non-linear editor in post-production? What, what kind of editing setup did you use for post-production? Um, I used, for the first two films, I used something called Edit Studio 5. Uh, that was a bit long in the tooth and not powerful enough for what I wanted to do, so I actually shelled out for a full copy of Sony Vegas Professional um, so that was a good £500 of the budget gone. And I used that uh, for Clear Skies 3, and it, it's extraordinarily powerful compared to what I had been using, and it meant I could do all of the post-production work as well as the actual editing um, in that. So I didn't use Adobe After Effects, although we were thinking about it at one point. Um, so no, Sony Vegas for everything, really. Uh, the website mentions, and I've seen some mentions on the Facebook page for Clear Skies as well, about staying tuned for merchandise. Do you have any plans to release a DVD, uh, you know, baseball caps, coffee mugs, uh, other kinds of, uh, of stuff about Clear Skies? Yeah, we've got plans to do some T-shirts and stuff with some choice quotes on there. Uh, no, not monocles, just all that. Very good. A little bit of politics there. I like it. Um, and uh, the major delay to that is me not getting my backside in gear to produce the art elements that are needed because um, I want to do the bucket first and then we'll we'll do some T-shirts and that kind of thing. Uh, but we'll do it through Cafe Press. So 
I think you can apply the designs to pretty much whatever you want. So you can have your mugs and your baseball caps. So that would be quite cool. Um, as for the DVD, um, I can't, the, there's a difficulty there really in that then it might be borderline problematic because I'll be selling something with two unlicensed game engines and a load of unlicensed music. So, you know, that might get a bit more frowned upon than just splatting out on, on the old internet. So I'm undecided on that at the moment. Plus, I have no idea what the demand would be and I wouldn't want to pay for a thousand discs to be pressed and sell three. So, um, yeah, not too sure about that. Here's an interesting idea from Baltir uh, Yudai. Uh, although you hate prequels, have you thought about a series of vignettes about any potential previous owners of the famous red sofa? <laughs> no, I, I truly have not ever thought of that. Um, I, I'm not really a one for doing vignettes or anything like that. Um, for me, it'd have to be a big project or nothing. Uh, so, no, not really. Now you keep talking about uh, Shadowrun. Ask a good question here. You keep talking and reiterating about the fear of, of uh, keeping that fear of death real in the movies. Uh, you're not making a fourth installment, but um, was that important that the characters are mortal and that their death is, is uh, an important plot element as keeping them alive? Yes, definitely. Um, I wrote the death of Haffer into the second one. Um, because I thought it would add a certain something and close the, the, the thing between J.R. and Haffer. And it was pushing myself on the writing front to, to have something as serious as that in the midst of it. And I found out afterwards there has been a, quite a few people have said that it actually made them cry, which is just incredible. People have bought into the... Um, into the characters that much that the death of Haffer generally, ge sorry, not generally, genuinely moved them. Um, and I thought, well, I can take that forward with Clear Skies 3 as well. Um, so I, in part, there was the the whole uh, JR breakdown sequence at the start, you know, where he loses the plot, plot and hits the bottle. Um, and then there was the wormhole sequence where I was rather hoping people were thinking, oh my god, he's not going to kill her, is he? Because uh, obviously I've got previous for killing off major characters. Um, so that was that. I think that added quite a bit to the tension of that scene, even though it ha all happened a little bit quickly for my tastes in the end. Um, and then, of course, I uh, killed off Captain Malozzi and all of his crew, and that has also made a few people cry, I've found out since, which is just fantastic. It was quite an emotional moment for me, and also the bit where the doors open right at the end and you see his three friends stood there, it's like, uh, uh, wow. It's, yeah, it's, uh, the, the fear of death uh, was very important because almost all of those scenes that, I've just mentioned, if you could just pop out the toaster again, as all fresh and new and, and cheery, then what's the point, really? I, I must admit, I, there were a couple of scenes in uh, CS2 and also CS3 where uh, I did get a little teared up, and in particular the scene where uh, Captain Rourke sees the rebuilt clear skies and he says, you rebuilt her, I, I, I still get choked up thinking about it. I do as well. <laughs> it's... Um... That was a scene that I wrote around that particular piece of music once again. Um, another Mike Oldfield track, and I just thought that build up with the with the, the uh, with the voice, you know, singing to start with quite quietly, and then there's that massive emotional build up, and bam, there you are into the really powerful final sequence of the song. I thought that's a reveal. That's a reveal moment. Da da! You have a new ship, and uh, so that whole scene was written around there, and all the dialogue was timed to fit the music and everything. And I know <laughs> when I was sat watching it at the cinema, and I had Richie to my right, he had the most amount of tears coming down his face. It, it was fantastic to have it affected him, even though he knew it was coming, because he helped write the damn script. And that was um. That was fantastic. Uh, it's a real rewarding moment for me. 
when you have the actors reacting to the script, and the script is very powerful from the standpoint of the characters really interplay off of each other. It is there is a lot of emotion in it, and and uh, it does. Uh, it's amazing how it comes through in what is essentially an animated uh, an animated film. Yeah, the, the, it was difficult doing all the face posing for that because obviously I have to control their their mouth and their smile and their eyebrows, their eyelids and the cheeks and all of that kind of jazz to try and convey the emotions. And most of it so far have been anger and surprise and and laughing. And then now I suddenly I had to put in <sighs> despair and sorrow and and Christ knows what else. So it's pretty difficult stuff. Um, but again, uh, it, it all paid off, and and that face posing stuff is so important for the immersion of people. Um, I had uh, one of the guys who came to watch it at the cinema. He said to me that he f- he forgot that he was watching voices um, from people he knew, and he forgot it was a film I did, and he forgot that it was done in graphics engines and stuff. He just sat and watched a film, and and that's as much as I could possibly ask for, really. I had the same experience. I know many of our uh, people who are watching today and listening today uh, had the same experience as well. Um, we do have a question here from us, uh, S. Rye Forns, which is, uh, you got Clear Sky shown at a local cinema. Uh, what was that experience like to see your work up on the big screen? It was expensive because I had to rent the cinema out, but, <laughs> but I sold a few tickets to recoup the cost. Um we had about 70-something people show up, which was great because it was a 98-seater. So it was a, it felt, you know, busy and yet not too claustrophobic. Um, everyone really enjoyed themselves, and the sound and the picture was just amazing. And to see, to see it up on a big screen, when I think back six years ago to when I first <clears> – cool, <throat> I'm getting a bit emotional here um, – when I – started writing clear skies and you said if you'd have said one day it'll be feature length in high def even though that didn't even exist back then and you'll be watching on the cinema with you know 70 other people i'd have laughed in your face i can't believe it actually got to that point i can tell that it had a big impact on you uh keldon ravon our ceo of eve university has a question uh he wants to know for john rourke why did you select Barney from Half-Life 2? Um, because he's a unique-looking character. Um, that's pretty much it, really. He looks like a strong male lead, and uh, he hasn't. He had an awful lot of built-in um, animations, gestures, because, of course, for the first two, I was limited to whatever gestures the, uh, the people used in the game, the shrugs, the hands coming out, the holding and all that kind of stuff. Didn't have any kind of idea of motion capture back then. Um, so I had to choose the characters pretty much based on technical limitations. It's like um, I had to choose Charlie in, with that get up with the backpack on to differentiate him from Sol. Otherwise, they'd have just worn exactly the same clothes. I didn't have any reskinning or anything going on back then. So, yeah, a lot of the choices were just because that's all I had to offer. Pence Barney. I hear that um, I've slightly ruined uh, Half-Life 2 for some people now because they see Barney and expect him to sound like me. <laughs> I've had the same experience myself. It just seems uh, it just seems wrong to hear him come out with a completely different accent. Uh, Narice asks another question here, which is good, something that's been on my mind as well. Who is Ken Roberts? Ah, Ken. Good old Ken. He's, um, he's a guy I work with. And uh, he played the prison guard in Clear Skies 2, the guy who let Sasha go and then got a a strip torn from him by a Jared. And he's got a very distinctive gravelly voice, and he loves the Clear Skies series. And he was um, was always avidly pushing me for, like, uh, what's going on with Clear Skies 3 and all that. And I said to him, look, I'm sorry but I can't give you a part in the third one as much as I'd like to because your voice is too distinctive. It would be quite obvious that you are the same actor playing a different role, and I just I didn't want to do that, Um, which was disappointing to him. So about uh, six, 12 12 months into the production, when I was thinking about um, the, the list of ships on screen and that sort of thing for when a carrier gets blown up, 
Um, I thought, actually, it'd be really nice if his name was one of the carriers. And it sounds like a car- you know, a ship name, the Ken Roberts. Um, and I thought, well, I-, I may as well have that be the one that gets blown up so they can say, sir, we've just lost the Ken Roberts. And I never told him, even though I wanted to for like a year, I wanted to tell him, ah, oh, there's a surprise coming up for you. I didn't drop any hints whatsoever. And the first time he saw that was at the cinema with everybody else. And I, I wish I could have seen his face. But the chap who sat next to him said, apparently his jaw landed in his lap. <laughs> so, result. Uh, Seamus Donahue asks, uh, does your girlfriend play, uh, play EVE Online? No, she doesn't play any computer games, really. So, no. <laughs> Does she find all of this uh, completely mysterious and perplexing, or is she somewhat understanding? She's very understanding, considering the last week of production I spent, I was doing 15-hour days from Monday to Saturday, I did, to finish the film off in time for release before the end of May. And she would come around, feed me, and go home, knowing that she could she just has to leave me to it. And I, and I told her from day one, you know, that this was going to get more and more intense the closer it got to the end. And and I made sure that I balanced um, seeing her with the film. I sacrificed playing computer games and going to the cinema and stuff like that to, to have the time to do what I wanted to do. But I never really sacrificed spending time with her because Clear Skies one kind of torpedoed a relationship in exactly that way. And I was, certainly wasn't going to repeat that mistake. But she was... Um, very once she knew what the hell was going on and got a handle of what, what, what I was talking about, she's very supportive in it. I mean, she got a credit in the mocap stuff because she came along with me to do um, uh, to work the laptop and all that sort of stuff with, with the motion capture, and she also taught me how to walk like a girl, for which I <laughs> will always be grateful to her, I think. Um, so, yeah, very supportive, very understanding, and she got involved with sorting out the cinema stuff and, and looking after the Facebook group, and it's generally all round ace. Um, the only time it was a bit interesting was my third date with her was straight after the night I motion captured the fight sequence. And when you spend an hour or so continually punching thin air or just yourself around suddenly because you've been hit by someone although there's no one there um the next morning you wake up really quite broken i strained pretty much every muscle i owned so i'm creaking around like a stroke victim going to this my third day and she's like what's wrong with you <laughs> well <laughs> heck of an introduction into what i do in my spare time that was how on earth do you start to explain that <laughs> And the fact that she still stayed with you and you've uh, got other plans today, obviously uh, uh, it's a good fit. Yeah, it was. It was a good fit. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go into that too much because I get all gushy about how much I love her. <laughs> uh, Halberdine asks a good question and touches on something I wanted to ask you as well. There are a number of Easter eggs, especially in CS3. Uh, for example, there's a poster on uh, Shady Slater's bridge that says something like "No Twiglets." Is that a reference to your friend uh, Twiglet you mentioned earlier? Yes, it is. That, that was CS2. Um, yeah, uh, he was supposed to have the part of Shady Slater. Oh, well, he wasn't called Shady, Shady Slater at the time. It was called Jim Branch, which is kind of a play on Jim and Twiglet. But. Um, uh, he he let me down on the voice recording for reasons I won't go into, and and he could have certainly have uh, handled things better. And I had this horrible mo- my the voice recording gear that I borrowed had to go back in a couple of weeks, and suddenly I knew he wasn't going to show up, and then I'd have no time, and then I'd be down one person, and it was almost a showstopper after like eight months of work. Um, so I was really quite angry about it all. Um, and, uh, I just put in the no twiglet thing in background for that scene. It's just as a a little metaphorical middle finger to the chap. Um, it's just, it's funny now, you know, I, I didn't, I never phoned him up and said, you're a F and B and whatever. And I never want to speak to you again. I just, I knew I'd get over it, but I was quite angry at the time so i thought i'll put that in just as a little nod to him to let him know you know that 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 i didn't really appreciate what happened funnily enough he had no clue that that caused me so much problem um until 
we're, I spoke to him in the pub after the CS3 cinema showing. So two years later, I said to him just how much it had annoyed me. Blokes say eh? we're great at communicating, and he said like, oh, he was really sorry because he didn't realise how much it had uh, it had upset me and and how much trouble it had caused me. But I saw water under the bridge now. And you do have a number of uh, uh, Easter eggs that we saw on CS3. They seems to be put more in them as you go along. Uh, the cake from uh, Portal and uh, Plan B on the shape charge and so forth. Uh, did you uh, think of those as you were going along, or is that something you uh, put into the script, uh, or just something that you thought would be a fun thing to do at the time? There are a lot of Easter eggs in Clear Skies too. I really went to town putting those in. Um, and th- there's a certain point in the development of Clear Skies 3 where I, I just suddenly had this big, in big writing across the script page, um, not enough humour. It was just too dark. There wasn't enough fun stuff. So I put in, well, the first thing that I did with that is Charlie Fodder walking in the, uh, the dodgy door in Gunnery and cracking his head off of it. But then I thought, I'm going to stick a few Easter eggs in as well. I, 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 I don't think there's as many as there were in CS2, but I'm, I'm a bit of a one for firing and forgetting these things and not realising just how much stuff I've put in. But uh, it just seems to be a natural thing. It's like I'm, I'm dressing the set and I just thought, hey, let's put in the, um, the companion cube and the cake because I've got those models from Portal to mess about with. And, and with the plan B, I just thought he's pulled out the bomb. There's no way I can not have Plan B written on the side because it's exactly what he'd do. You know, things like that. Um, in the, the galley where they all have the big conversation about how the hell they're going to take the Sino Jammer out, you can see because it's a rebuilt ship, he's got like new stoves delivered and the wall panelling's half finished and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, well, we'll have the old table that used to be in there but still in its flat pack form and just take the mickey out of... Um, uh, out of Ikea. And I see someone's just asked a question, why the Wikipedia hate? Well, <laughs> that was um, after Clear Skies 1, some people liked it so much they added it to the uh, notable machinima uh, section in Wikipedia. And some some weasel who had red versus blue firmly stuck up a certain orifice pretty much came on there and said, this isn't red versus blue, therefore it's not relevant, and deleted the article. And I just thought, well, up yours, guys. And so there's the Wikipedia thing with tossers written underneath it. So, yeah, that's why that. I I noticed that the uh, article has now been resurrected on Wikipedia um, due to apparently it's notable now it's won seven bloody awards. Thank you very much. But I'm half of a mind to delete it myself, saying, actually, up yours. But that might be a bit childish, so I won't. (laughs) <laughs> uh, you know, I, I was a fan of Red versus Blue. It was a lot of fun, but of course, it was very limited in, in terms of plot and actual movie making. You know, clearly, there's no comparison. I don't understand. Clearly, they would, they would understand that Clear Skies Three deserves a place in in that article. Well, it's on IMDb now, so I'm hopefully it can go on Wikipedia. <laughs> I did notice that, and uh, that. That just recently came up on IMDb the other day, uh, and was that because of the Hollywood legitimate uh, actors that you had? In, or how did that happen? It's uh, well, I, I looked up how you get it sub, uh, submitted on there because I've been ch- chatting to a couple of other people who've done this sort of thing, and um, there's they've got some very strict rules. And for internet-based stuff, obviously they have to limit it to notable people being in it because otherwise they'd be inundated with a load of stuff um luckily i had francis and i had ricky so i i went through on one night shift to uh, putting in the massive amounts of information they want on their site and uh, left it for a week or so and uh, up it popped it was accepted so that was really quite brilliant so yeah i'm on imdb how cool is that <laughs> that's very cool um one thing I did want to ask, and Sidiab uh, Naramid asks, uh, kind of touches on this as well. There are a number of catchphrases that have come out of uh, all the Clear Skies movies now. I, I mean, the wingy bit and hop drop o'clock and how much and et cetera and so forth. Did you expect uh, that many catchphrases to be captured by the Eve community? No, no, I did not. It's 
just amazing how many people have um, uh, have been discussing their favourite lines. The Facebook group has got a thread about what's your favourite line, and they've pretty much recited the entire film, I think. Um, there's a ridiculous amount, but yeah. I like the uh, I like the fact that um, the stuff that I've put in the script has obviously hit home and worked how I wanted it to be. You know, funny throwaway lines or or meaningful lines, things that 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 really do shift the film along and portray the characters and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, I really did like Charlie's "What sort of shape?" spherical. I personally thought that was a hilarious line, but then I wrote it. Um, so that's a bit egotistical of me. Um, and I, I didn't really expect the madness about around hot drop o'clock, and I certainly wasn't expecting how much to become a catchphrase. It was just like a good line to open the whole damn thing on. Um, the weirdest thing I've ever had from all of that is when I was in a fleet battle, well, you know, a, a fleet gate camp load of tedium, and uh, there was about 250 people on the TeamSpeak server, and, and they started doing impersonations of me which is really quite weird and um the worst bit about it was they were rubbish because they're americans <laughs> yeah that wouldn't work at all um the uh, uh i do have a couple of other questions that are coming up here but while we're waiting i do do want to ask you about um, some of your colleagues. Uh, I know John Guthrie has gotten back into Clear Skies, but uh, I think he's the only one. Are there any other uh, folks that you work with on the movies that have gotten back into uh, actively into Clear? I'm sorry, into Eve. Um, no, not that I know of. Uh, some of the people who who were involved in the creation of it are still Eve players, such as DJ Sam and Spuffy, obviously, and um, the uh, Bjorn, the set design guy. He's he sort of potters around in there, but um, no, there's um, it's a, just a case of life moves on. Most of the people involved in CS were day naught players. You know, they joined back in crossed what was it, two thousand and three. Um, and it's quite a surprise for Richie to stick to anything for that long because uh, he doesn't have that big an attention span for computer games and stuff. Um, Haffa is busy with a day job photography career and uh, a one-year-old child now. Um, you know, it's just difficult with time because the joys of growing up, I suppose. So, yeah, unfortunately, just Charlie, me and, and Twiglet knocking around from the original crew, really. Uh, Shadowrun asks a good question here, follow up to that. Uh, what do you intend to do with the rest of your Eve experience now that you're done with the Clear Skies uh, series? Are, are you going to be playing the game more often, or uh, is this something you're going to be – are you here to stay, I guess is the question. Yeah, I'm going to be playing it more often. Um, I've finally found the undock button again after some searching, and <laughs> I've headed over and joined up with uh, the Grey Council because um, Twiglet was already in there, and uh, for some reason they were more than willing to let in 120 million skill points on Rourke. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, I, I felt quite guilty breaking away from the corporation that's carried my ass for the last four years, but to be honest, I'd barely done anything with them um, because I was too busy doing the films, and I think in order to get back into the game, to get a run at it and, and enjoy myself again, I needed a complete and utter change. So I've moved to the other side of the galaxy with precisely one ship, and we'll see what happens. You mentioned uh, we were talking earlier before uh, the interview started um, that you've been away from me for a while. You've now come in. We've got the new Incarna release, and it seems dramatically different. Have you found it to be disorienting uh, to get back into Eve and find so many new and different things? Well, I've been um, on and off it over time and I've been reading the patch notes every now and again it did get to a ridiculous situation where every time I logged on I had to download a patch that's how sporadic my um, uh, my use of Eve was uh, but I kept coming on because there's some things that I had to shoot in game or I had to set up a shot for a texture your screen grab or something like that so I would um, I kind of kept up with all the, the new stuff I, mean, I have very little idea of how um, 
the factional warfare works, never mind the new one, the incursion stuff, and wormholes I potted around in a few times with Twiglet causing trouble until um, it got more dangerous than fun. Uh, otherwise, I've never even seen a sleeper drone in game. I hope I pick the right models, by the way. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a little bit daunting, but I pick this stuff up pretty quickly, and, and the basics are still there. Go over there, um, panic, mash all the function keys, hope you don't explode first. Well, I do want to reiterate, if you want a safe uh, and enjoyable place to get reoriented to EVE, I must offer you uh, EVE University as an alternative. Well, I, I, I've joined up Grey Council now, but I don't mind having links to the EVE University in some way or another. That would be uh, that would be fine. Well, we're going on almost uh, 80 minutes here, over 80 minutes, so uh, we will take some final questions and we'll wrap up. And I want to thank you, Ian, for spending all this time with us. This has been absolutely fascinating and uh, learned quite a bit. I do have a couple of other questions while we get down here toward the end here. Um, first of all, Goral Abras asks, did you have Ricky and Francis come to England for the voice recording, or how did you engineer that? No, I didn't. Um Obviously, that would have been quite a, an ask for those two. Luckily, because uh, Ricky is uh, dead into voice recording and sound design and stuff, he has a room, a little closet under the stairs that's dedicated to this sort of thing. He's got some high-end gear. It's all soundproofed. So his lines were uh, easy. Um, Francis's was not so simple. He, he got a... Um, he got a new headset, which was pretty good quality, except it kept dropping regularly the the the, the sound recording because it was over wireless and there was some problem. We had to turn off his other computers. I had him huddled under a duvet, would you believe, um, to get rid of echoes and to, to deaden the sound. Um, but the, the audio drops on his headset were a nightmare, and his other headset, the quality was awful. So I was, I was starting to think, God, what's you know? How the hell am I ever going to get this done? This is implausible. Um, but I, they both live in Los Angeles, so I got Ricky and Francis together round Ricky's, and the two of them uh, did the voice recording in Ricky's closet, and then Ricky sorted it all out and sent it over to me. It was just, it was incredibly good of Ricky to do that, and it was really nice of Francis to take all that time out um, in order to do this project. Yeah, so uh, it was very stressful, and until I got those WAVs and I checked them, and, and that was all the lines, and he backed in, it, it all worked, it wasn't until then that I mentioned that Francis was in it, because at any moment it could have been a, a, a no-go, really. Well, it worked out very well. The quality is excellent. Uh, in, in the, uh, of course, you had to do all of the audio editing and so forth, but uh, it is uh, consistently good. Um, do have a question here as well, uh, a good one to end with from Iliarni uh, Durana, and that is, why did you choose to name your ship Clear Skies? I had to think up a title for the series. Well, didn't know it was a series back then, but I thought I'm going to name the show after the ship that's in it. And um, I'm quite a big fan of Ian e M. Banks um, novels where all of the AI powered ships in there have these ridiculous names. Um, and that was the inspiration I had. It, the Clear Skies isn't a name of one of those ships, but I, I just thought it's something. Um, unpretentious, optimistic. Um, it's not like I am Leet, I am Uber. It's just, this is what we enjoy doing. Um, we want to sail out there and have clear skies. Excellent. Ian, thanks so much. i very, very pleased to have you here as our guest. I hope you had a good time. I know I certainly did. And based on all of the feedback that, that I'm getting here, uh, all of us here in the uni did as well. So thanks for joining us today and being part of this. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I, I can talk about this a lot. So, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. I have one final request before we go. And uh, Setab asked this earlier. Would you exclaim how much for us? Uh, I can do, yeah. <clears throat> Pressure's on now. How much? 30 million isk. 
you have no idea how long I've wanted to do that. <laughs> All right, Just Thank don't you. ask me to do hot drop o'clock because uh, I'll probably clip the microphone something terrible. <laughs> Oh, that was awesome. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Ian. We hope to have you back again sometime. And uh, Anytime. Drop me a line. Thanks, everyone. Good luck and fly safe.